May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. I wonder what are the most precious things that you have inherited. Here are some of mine. This is my grandfather's walking stick in the shape of a dog. It has no intrinsic value at all, but it's been worn by his hands. It was made of resin. This is just resin. And you can see the colours, the green and, and the red as his hand wore it down to the resin from which it's made. But it's very precious to me. This is my this is my father's Bible. Um, it was uh, given to him when he was nine years old in 1944. And um, he, he kept it and used it all the way through when he joined up with, in the uh, boys' service, when he was in the army, and then um, beyond that. This is my dad's Bible. It was precious to him all his life. And then um, these are my... Um, uh, my mother's recipes. This is an old Delia Smith book and um, she's collected all these recipes in here, some of which she's written but some of which she's just collected. But here in this little book um, she wrote out the recipes that she'd had from her grandmother when her grandmother taught her uh, how, to, how to cook all those years ago and so that's very very precious to me. But I've also inherited left-handedness and ability to be able to dream and imagine things into being that aren't yet. I've inherited the ability to analyse data and information really accurately and well and also an ability to really see people and understand them. All of these are arguably much more precious, actually, and much more used to be truthful than these physical things that I've shown you now. And of course, I've inherited the gospel, the gospel of Jesus. It's been inherited from some people that were very, very important to me in my late teens who handed on the gospel to me and I welcomed the gospel. I was hospitable to them and to it and ultimately to the Lord Jesus Christ who I welcomed into my heart, mind and life. Now the gospel reading talks about this. Jesus predicts that this is what's going to happen, that, that, that the faith down the ages is like this great big long relay race. It all begins in the mission-hearted mind of the Father. Uh, the Father who gives of himself in creation and who gives of himself in salvation and imparts himself to the world in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, if you welcome me, then you welcome the one who sent me. But he also says to the apostles, these apostles that he's just chosen who are going to take his message out, that anyone who welcomes you welcomes me and welcomes the one who sent me. And of course, the apostles then um, imparted the message of Christ to others after Christ had died. And people received the message from the apostles and then the apostles died. And then those people, having received the message of the apostles, imparted that message to other people who believed and received it. And then they died and so on down the generations. I wonder who it was who really caught your imagination, who imparted to you not just the content of the gospel, but the importance of it, who has inspired in you this sense of spirituality, of needing to be open to God, of worship, of the Christian faith, because it's not normal anymore to believe. The um, percentages of those who are Christians in our land are you know, something between around about 5%, I suppose. So we, 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 aren't, we aren't common anymore. Something happened. It's important to you. Who was it who did that for you? 
we have received the gift of the gospel and received it in a particular way, in a particular form, and we have received it in our own unique way also. This sequence of receiving a precious gift, holding it, it being important to us, it's shaping our lives, and then us handing it on, reminds me of a wonderful children's story called Badger's Parting Gifts. It's a story that I've used to help children to understand death and bereavement. I hope you won't mind if I share it now. Badger's Parting Gifts by Susan Varley Read by Ruby D. Badger was dependable, reliable, and always ready to help when help was needed. He was also very old, and he knew almost everything. Badger was so old that he knew he must soon die. Badger wasn't afraid of death. Dying meant only that he would leave his body behind, and as his body didn't work as well as it had in days gone by, Badger wasn't too concerned about that. His only worry was how his friends would feel when he was gone. Hoping to prepare them, Badger had told them that someday soon he would be going down the long tunnel, and he hoped they wouldn't be too sad when it happened. One day, as Badger was watching Mole and Frog race down the hillside, he felt especially old and tired. He wished more than anything that he could run with them, but he knew his old legs wouldn't let him. He watched Mole and Frog for a long time, enjoying the sight of his friends having a good time. It was late when he arrived home. He wished the moon good night and closed the curtains on the cold world outside. He made his way slowly down to the warm fire that was waiting for him deep underground. He had his supper and then sat down at his desk to write a letter. When he had finished, he gently rocked himself to and fro and soon was fast asleep, having a strange yet wonderful dream like none he'd ever had before. Much to Badger's surprise, he was running. Ahead of him was a very long tunnel. His legs felt strong and sure as he ran towards it. He no longer needed his walking stick, so he left it lying on the floor of the tunnel. Badger moved swiftly, running faster and faster through the long passageway until his paws no longer touched the earth. He felt himself turning end over end, tumbling and falling, but nothing hurt. He felt free. It was as if he had fallen out of his body. The following day, Badger's friends gathered anxiously outside Badger's door. They were worried because he hadn't come out to say good morning as he always did. Fox broke the sad news that Badger was dead and read Badger's note to them. It said simply, Gone down the long tunnel. Bye-bye, Badger. All the animals had loved Badger, and everyone was very sad. Mole especially felt lost, alone, and desperately unhappy. In bed that night, Mole could think only of Badger. Tears rolled down his velvety nose, soaking the blankets he clung to for comfort. Outside, it began to snow. Winter had begun. The snow covered the countryside, but it didn't conceal the sadness that Badger's friends felt. Badger had always been there when anyone needed him. Badger had told them not to be unhappy, but it was hard not to be. As spring drew near, the animals often visited each other and talked about the days when Badger was alive. Mole was good at using scissors, and he told about the time Badger had taught him how to cut out a chain of moles from a piece of folded paper. Paper moles had littered the ground that day, 
Mole remembered the joy he'd felt when he had finally succeeded in making a complete chain of moles with all the paws joined. Frog was an excellent skater. He recalled how Badger had helped him take his first slippery steps on the ice. Badger had gently guided him across the ice until he had gained enough confidence to glide out on his own. Fox remembered how, when he was a young cub, he could never knot his tie properly until Badger showed him how. Fox could now tie every knot ever invented and some he'd made up himself. And of course, his own tie was always perfectly knotted. Each of the animals had a special memory of Badger, something he had taught them that they could now do extremely well. He had given them each something to treasure, a parting gift that would become all the more special each time it was passed on to others. As the last of the snow melted, so did the animals' sadness. Whenever Badger's name was mentioned, someone remembered another story that made them all smile. One warm spring day, as Mole was walking on the hillside where he'd last seen Badger, he wanted to thank his friend for his parting gift. Thank you, Badger, he said softly, believing that Badger would hear him. And somehow, Badger did. So having asked you, who was it who inspired you to follow the Christian way, inspired you in the walk of Christian faith? Let me ask you this, what did you receive from those people? What particular insights and gift did you, did you receive? What was it that really caught your imagination? What was it that helped you really understand what faith is? One thing's for sure, whatever it was, whatever it was, whether it was scripture or music or actions or fellowship or architecture or a sense of spirituality, whether it was morality or ethics, uh, whether it was community, whatever it was, that which you received, you had to receive by being hospitable, as the Gospels show us. This Gospel passage for today comes at the end of a whole series of teaching from Jesus about mission, and, and, and the theme right the way through it is hospitality. That the Apostles and those who are appointed after the Apostles to work with them are meant to go and see where hospitality is offered, them and the one who sent them. So they go two by two into villages, and if the village receives them, they stay there. And if the villager uh, rejects them, they shake the dust off their feet and go somewhere else. When they find a home that will receive them, they stay there. And if there is no home for them, then they go somewhere else. In other words, the gospel is offered, it's not imposed. You have received the gospel, you received the spiritual gift from whoever it was who inspired you, who taught you, who drew you in, who showed you a different way. And there was hospitality in your heart and mind for what it was they had to give you. And that attitude of being open, welcoming, is what we're looking for. It's what God's looking for and it's what we're looking for in these days. It's what I'm looking for as I pray and seek the building up of the church community at St Mary and St Eansworth. It's what I'm looking for in the community um, in which our church community is situated, in the wider community. Who is it? Who are the people of peace upon upon whom, if I pray God's peace, the peace will rest, who are interested. I see a flicker in people's eyes. I see interest on their faces, or I see nothing but dullness or boredom. 
And it's the ones who open up to the possibilities of the gospel. They're the ones who are beginning to show a flicker of that hospitality that we're looking for. And I wonder, therefore, if I could ask you this. Having received the gifts that you've received from the people who inspired you to receive them, what is it that you have to give others in terms of the gospel? In what way could you inspire others? And who is it in your life and amongst the people that you know who shows an interest in what you have to offer? Who are the ones who are hospitable to the faith that you have to share in the way that you and only you can share it. I don't mean evangelism, that kind of that kind of imposing of your views on somebody else. I'm talking about when you are you in the faith that you have and express it in the way that you express it. Who's interested? Who are the ones who show a spark and who are interested? Can you spend time with them? Can you offer them? the insights that you have. Who are those people that you can spend time with? And the kind of welcoming that there is, is not always a becoming an apostle or, or becoming like the person that you've heard it from. Um, there are various different possibilities and scenarios in the gospel reading. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. A prophet is a person not who foretells God's word, but forth tells God's word. A prophet is the one who proclaims God's word, explains it and, understand, uh, and, and helps people understand what God's word means for life and living and the times that they're in. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. Again, these are people who, who show forth what it means to live in God's way, who show what it is to live. In the, um, in the gratitude and the honesty and the loving kindness of the gospel, of the presence of Jesus, who show forth a peaceable life and what it is to live with God. And then, and then whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, the name of a disciple, truly, I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. These are people who, who show that, that intuition of kindness, who see a need and reach out to meet it in action. However small that need is, all these are ways of communicating the love of Christ to others. The content of the scriptures, what it is to live um, the rhythm of a spiritual life that can be so attractive. How it is then others who, who show how it is that we can begin to meet the needs of others, seeing needs and having the loving kindness to be able to meet them. You will have received the gospel from people like this, and you may be one of those kinds of people. And, and as, you, as you reach out to others and offer simply what it is that you have, when it's received, those people re will receive a reward and a gift in the very same way that you receive them. It's worth thinking about. Who is it that I have received the gift of faith from or through? What kind of faith did I receive? What kind of person am I now because of it? What gift resonated with me that I now have? And then, who is it that I can pass this on to? Who are the people of peace? The people who will welcome and give hospitality to the things that I can share. What is it that I can share with them? In the name of Jesus. Amen.